Has there been a conspiracy to hide a carnivore study for a hundred years? Hi, I'm Dr. Eric Westman and welcome to my channel where I review and debunk nutritional information online. Thanks for sending this video. It's uh, another one from this group called Carnivore Squad. It has a AI generated voice, I'm assuming, and it, kind of like a, a referee who used to play for a team that you're now a referee of. Um, I'm gonna have to just be honest. And, and while I want the home team to win, I have to, you know, call the they call the the penalties or the fouls as I see them. So please be sure to wait till the end to see my final thoughts. Hello, friends. Unfortunately, one of the biggest narratives long orchestrated against the carnivore diet by the big evil corporations is that it lacks the validation of any authentic research conducted by any noteworthy institution. But friends, this is not the true picture at all. Thanks to the biased and agenda-driven sources of information, there has been a lot of critical stuff going on in the past, which has been purposely kept hidden from our knowledge. Information that could have reshaped how we approach health and nutrition decades ago. Well, so really, you have someone in the, the dark web hiding the information 100 years ago. So we're going to see a lot of hyperbole here. It's going to be so biased toward the carnivore diet. What does the data actually really show? Keeping this in mind for our viewers, we have dug out an incredible piece of history today, something so crucial for us, which absolutely shatters all the false narrative buildup against the meat-based eating approach for the last 100 years. Yes, we have got something so valuable related to the carnivore diet, which is literally as precious to the carnivore followers as are the grand historic treasures discovered at the Great Pyramids for the die-hard historians out there. Oh, jeez. Oh. This is just kind of amusing how how uh, extreme and, and how the study is, is like, the, like the pyramids. Now, this is hard to believe, but there was an official 12-month clinical trial conducted nearly 100 years ago, studying what we know today as the all-meat carnivore diet. Yes, friends, published by the well-known Journal of American Medical Association, JAMA, back in 1929, some mind-blowing and astounding outcomes were found about the today's carnivore diet. Now, time out. I have to just say, the language here is really important. And one of the major takeaways from this video is what is a clinical trial? What is it, how do you define it? How do you use it in a video like this and, and get away with it? A clinical trial argues for, well, a clinic or, or a people, humans, who have disease or, or they're being followed in some sort of way. And a study or a trial is just some sort of manipulation. Of, you know, it could be an experimental randomized trial. In any way, the clinical trial word or phrase here, you're going to see is used, I don't know, dozens of times. I, I didn't actually count how many times. But what we're going to hear about is one person's experience, one, one ex man's experience. Today, it would be more appropriate to say an N of one study rather than a clinical trial. And you're going to hear even the language being, the, being brought all the way to safety and efficacy as if it was an FDA approved drug when we're talking about one person's experience a hundred years ago. While chronic diseases such as diabetes, obesity, heart disease, and cancer rise to epidemic levels, the average person is encouraged to follow a plant-based diet loaded with grains, fruits, vegetables, and processed foods that only exacerbate these issues. Yet, hidden in the annals of medical history is a 1929 clinical trial that provides evidence directly opposing the mainstream dietary dogma. Give us the information, please. The study, published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, JAMA, followed Arctic explorer Vilyalmur Stefansson and fellow adventurer Karsten Anderson, who lived on an all-meat diet for an entire year under strict medical supervision. Their experiment provides not only a key piece of scientific evidence, but an irrefutable validation of the carnivore diet that it can rapidly lead to optimal health. Okay, two people. Sorry about that. And th this is a classic study that actually I tell people to read. And it's part of the history of the disbelief in all food, all real food kinds of diets that you don't have to worry about micronutrients and things like that. 
In fact, one of my teachers, Steve Finney, talks about Wilmer Stefansson for, for, for ages. He, he tells the stories about it, how, how the Arctic explorers who were English, if they got stuck in the ice and they didn't go and eat like the Inuit, they all died. But many of them didn't deign to go down and eat like raw meat because that was not very British, apparently, at the time. So uh, the idea here that there are so many other diseases, you know, it's getting to where are the results, right? So anyway, we're going to see them right now. The results were so groundbreaking, yet threatening to the food and pharmaceutical industries, that the trial was essentially censored from the available media. Well, again, you know, what's the evidence for that? You know, there there was no media then, really. You know, uh, and the idea that this study, uh, which is, and then they called it an experiment. An experiment, typically you have isolated a certain factor. Again, this would be called an N of one study today. Now, before diving into the details of this landmark study, it's essential to understand the context and key figure behind it. Viljalmer Stefansson. Stefansson was a seasoned Arctic explorer and ethnologist, best known for his time spent living among the Inuit people. From 1906 to 1918, Stefansson immersed himself in the Inuit way of life, adopting their diet, which was primarily composed of meat, fat, and virtually no plant matter. His observations were eye-opening. The Inuit, who consumed almost no fruits, vegetables, or grains, appeared to be in peak physical condition, exhibiting robust health, unparalleled strength and resilience to the chronic diseases that plagued Western populations at the time, including scurvy, heart disease, and diabetes. The 1929 clinical trial was conducted at Bellevue Hospital, a reputable medical institution known for its dietary research. The experiment was designed to scrutinize Stephenson's claims rigorously. Along with fellow Arctic explorer Karsten Anderson, Stephenson agreed to eat nothing but meat for an entire year while being closely monitored by a team of doctors including Dr. Clarence Lieb and Dr. Eugene Dubois, both respected experts in metabolic research. For the first three months, Stephenson and Anderson were confined to the hospital, where their diet was strictly monitored. Every bite of food they consumed was weighed, their vital signs and blood markers were regularly tested, and their overall health was meticulously recorded. Yeah, and I, I think this is an accurate reporting of that paper. And because there was such disbelief that he had gone and, and had that experience, he volunteer, voluntarily got um, hospitalized for the three months and then followed for a year. The Inuit diet, because of the Arctic weather conditions, was very low in carbohydrates. It's one of those people, the, the populations that we kind of pull out at meetings and conferences to say, well, the Inuit didn't eat many carbohydrates, you know. The Maasai didn't eat many carbohydrates. The, just whether they're same metabolically, that's been argued that they're different. In any case, I think the idea that several people got hospitalized and showed that it was healthy by the parameters that were available at the time didn't change the needle much, you know, what, it's not a clinical trial, it's, well, there would be an N of two, then a case series, a case study is one person, a case series would be anything more than one person, maybe up to, you know, 50 or, or 100, and, you know, when do you call it a clinical trial? Our first paper on a low-carb diet was published in 2002, and it was 50 people, just 50 people, not randomized, following 50 people over six months under conditions uh, that were monitored by an outside group. We called that a clinical trial, although it wasn't a randomized controlled trial. That was our paper in 2004 on the low-carb diet versus low-fat diet, Yancey et al., 2004. So just back to the Inuit diet, uh, I, I went to a conference put on by Jay Wartman, Dr. Wartman, lives uh, outside of Vancouver in Canada, and he put on a conference with the Canada Health Organization on the traditional diet for diabetes. And it, it turns out that in that area of Canada, the traditional diet was also very low in carbohydrates. And he got together a study, and the study putting people on a low-carb diet in Vancouver, in that area, the Namgis First Nations, 
actually ended up in a CBC Canadian broadcasting company documentary film called My Big Fat Diet. And so the idea that these diets existed and and people thrived on them for a long time is pretty well well established and understood. Whether a, a Caucasian could go eat that way and be healthy, this is what was being tested and it was shocking at the time, you know, a hundred years ago. One of the primary concerns of the researchers was that a diet composed entirely of meat would result in vitamin deficiencies, particularly vitamin C. After all, vitamin C was thought to be available only from fruits and vegetables, and its absence in the diet was known to cause scurvy, a disease that plagued sailors and explorers who lacked access to fresh produce during long sea voyages. Yet neither Stephenson nor Anderson developed scurvy during the year-long trial. This finding alone was monumental. That reminds me of that conference on diabetes that was put on by Health Canada. And the Health Canada expert got up and said, yes, it's true, the Inuit didn't really ever have citrus fruit or fruits and vegetables, and they didn't have vitamin C. And she basically admitted that there is vitamin C in the meat, especially the skin. And the idea that there might be different conditional amounts necessary depending on your metabolism is something that needs further study for sure. Do you need less vitamin C if you don't eat the fruit That's, you know, or eat the carbohydrates? That's an open-ended question. But this Health Canada researchers admitted the Inuit didn't get vitamin C problems and had pretty good health. But then she ended her talk by saying, but of course I want you to eat the 12 servings of grains that the, the Health Canada Food Pyramid says. They basically borrowed the USDA Food Pyramid back in the day. So anyway, it was a, a research level conference where you didn't have to come in and just mouth the, the Health Canada and also the USDA Food Pyramid recommendation. That's not what we were there for, but uh, that, is a factor you're going to see where people are just kind of mouthing the guidelines that are available. The results suggest that when the human body is in its natural fat-burning state, it requires fewer antioxidants, and meat alone is enough to provide the nutrients needed for optimal health. Well, so that's the, the pro-carnivore theory or theoretical basis that you are producing fewer oxidative stress molecules because you're not eating the carbohydrates, so you need less antioxidants. I think that's an open-ended question, but that is one of the, the rationales that, that makes sense, but really needs further study. And I, I wouldn't say that these myths are, are totally debunked by the N of two study that we just saw. So that this pro-carnivore biased video is takes it just a little farther than I'm comfortable with. Myth two, a high protein diet will damage your kidneys. Another significant concern going into the study was the potential for kidney damage. The medical consensus at the time, and even today, argued that high protein diets could overwhelm the kidneys, leading to dysfunction or long-term damage. Yet, after a full year of consuming nothing but animal products, including large amounts of protein, neither Stephenson nor Anderson showed any signs of kidney damage. Their kidney function remained normal, and they had no indications of increased strain or health problems related to protein metabolism. This finding is particularly relevant for modern-day carnivores, who are constantly warned that their high-protein intake will lead to kidney issues. Well, you know, hang on. <laughs> Two people? So, I have to, you know, be the referee here. Although there are several studies now, one from our clinic and one from Dr. Unwin's clinic in the UK that followed people in these clinical programs and looked at their kidney disease and it did not worsen any greater than any other kind of diet. So add the hundreds of people that we followed to the two here and I'm more confident with that information to say that we shouldn't worry about the kidneys. You shouldn't be worried about starting the diet if you have kidney trouble, but you need to monitor, monitor the kidneys like you would on any diet. Their blood pressure remained stable, their heart function was normal, and there was no evidence of arterial plaque buildup. 
These findings suggest that the true culprits behind cardiovascular disease are not animal fats, but rather the inflammatory effects of carbohydrates and processed foods. That weren't available at that time. <laughs> Just one year, whatever diet you do for a year, you don't have a heart attack. Does that prove that it doesn't cause heart disease? No, that's a stretch. Now a pinching question arises. Why was this huge truth suppressed? Why this study was banned? With such stunning results, you might wonder why this study has not been more widely discussed or referenced in modern nutrition science. The answer lies in the vested interests of big food and big pharma, two powerful industries that profit immensely from keeping people sick and dependent on processed foods and medications. Well, I don't know that there's evidence that it's been banned. Or, or just if it's not cited, that's a different issue, meaning people just aren't interested in it. And it only has two people in it while it was for a year. But, you know, an anecdote, that would be something that you hear your friend, your a doctor's patient, you know, one anecdote. It's not monitored. Um, this is stronger evidence than an anecdote, which means that it, they submitted to being monitored over that period of time for the first three months in the hospital and then uh, as an outpatient for that. So it's a monitored type of case study. Of course, the measures that were used are not modern day measures. This was done in 1929. And, but the modern measures that I would have wanted perhaps would be kind of like the cholesterol code char study. The Citizen Science Foundation is looking at the CT angiograms of people who are following low carb, some of them keto, some of them carnivore types of diets. You can monitor that uh, your own atherosclerosis as well. So the limited measures that they had back then probably led to it not being widely cited. Also the idea that vitamins and minerals were just being discovered. And that's what Steve Finney argues it was the main reason why people didn't look toward just a whole food sort of thing. They were just learning about micronutrients, the different vitamins, and that got the focus. Uh, there, was, there was no dark web like the guy has. It's been interesting to watch modern day uh, filming, like the, the kidneys lighting up. Well, they didn't do that back then, 100 years ago. So uh, again, the, the reality of what happened then and the story being told now, it's overselling way beyond what I'm comfortable with. Well, I'm going to stop that video here with the Stefan Sun uh, case series, the two, end of two clinical study over a year, or I wouldn't call it a clinical trial. The safety and efficacy language comes later in the video, and that having this information does not by any means mean that you can use the language of safety and efficacy, which is kept kind of sacred for drug approvals and requires a lot of evidence uh, before FDA will give approval for this, this kind of level of scientific proof. So I'm afraid the being the referee that the pro-carnivore bias comes out in this, yes, there were two people that went for a year without eating anything but meat and organ meats, and that, that's reassuring. The study from Harvard was a survey, and I've done a video on that survey before on the internet, not a clinical trial, not an experiment. And so I follow some of you, some of you may be my patients following a carnivore or carnivore-ish diet and we have this kind of discussion where we need to monitor everything that has to do with health, take you off medicine safely if the carnivore or low-carb keto diet reverses these medical conditions, which they can. So if you're on medications, be careful because they can become too strong and harm you if you don't get off them fast enough. But so I'm afraid this is a little bit biased toward the carnivore diet. And, you know, don't get me wrong, I'm rooting, rooting for the team. <laughs> I, I think my hunch over time is that when done properly, this kind of approach will be shown to be help, helpful and healthy, but we just don't have that kind of information yet. And, you know, watching comments and having people come in telling me their stories is all well and good. It doesn't tell you the denominator of, you know, what about the people that didn't come back or that were unable to follow it. And when you think about it, the selection bias 
with Stefansson and his colleague is that they already went there and they knew they could survive there and then came back and showed it. That was, they, they didn't just take the Joe, uh, Joe American and send them or, or, you know, so they may have had some special, unique capability to withstand that kind of change of diet. I don't know. But uh, I'm very interested in more research in this area. That would be a high priority because of the benefits that so many people have had by not eating plant-based, plant-sourced foods. I hope you like this. If you like, please like, subscribe, and ring the notification bell. I'm putting out new information on Wednesdays and Fridays. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell, and check out adapterlifeacademy.com.